talk something about new versus standard errors. That was uh, 642. So this is some additional reading. I think that's the best reading on new versus standard errors. Um, the sort of problem with Wooldridge is that um, Wooldridge does it in observation vice form vice form and that is by far not as convenient as the matrix form that uh, actually that should be an E that's green so we know that if our error terms so let me first state uh, the model again okay uh, let's say we have a model y equals x beta plus u where the variance of u is equal to omega. Now what we have learned before is that if the u are heteroscedastic, let me just abbreviate it with hs and or autocorrelated, that's the AC, then the correct formula for the variance of beta hat, and really beta hat all s, that's what I mean here, but we're not talking about any other estimator, so I'll leave that away, is this formula, okay, this beauty here. We've derived that in the heteroscedasticity case. I told you already in the autocorrelation case exactly the same. So this is where we are. So in practice, however, we need an estimate for omega. Because omega, our variance covariance matrix of u, is unknown. Okay, because it's unknown, that's why we had to test whether it is described by heteroscedastic, heteroscedasticity and or autocorrelation. If we knew what omega was, we could immediately see whether the values on the diagonal are different and whether there are non-zero values on the off-diagonal, which would indicate autocorrelation. So in practice, we need an estimate for omega. Let's just have a uh, little flashback to heteroscedasticity. Okay. A flashback to heteroscedasticity. Or we'll just rem remind ourselves what we did there, and then it's going to be a little bit easier to understand what we do in the autocorrelation case. So, what basically for the I'm going to repeat what sort of estimate we used for heteroscedasticity, and that then delivered the white standard errors. And then we'll introduce a slightly different estimate for omega, that will be the new vest uh, methodology, and that will deliver what are called new vest standard errors. And they are useful for when error terms are autocorrelated. So this is what we did uh, for heteroscedasticity. We needed the structure, so this was the structure of a heteroscedastic omega. Okay. Importantly, we had differing values on the diagonal and the trick. So that was Halvide's trick was to get an estimate. That's why we have that hat on here of omega. We take our estimated all s residuals and put them on the diagonal. Okay, so these are the squares of the estimated all s residuals. Okay, that was useful because we argued that u1 hat squared was some sort of proxy for this was some sort of proxy for this one by itself a pretty rubbish one because we estimate a variance on the basis of one observation but in the context 
of using that omega hat in this formula up here, it turned out to be pretty good. The question is now, what do we do if we have autocorrelated residuals? So, place that in here. So that was the so far the end of the flashback. Now we are with autocorrelated residuals. Let's compare firstly the structure of. So this, this guy here is now the, the structure of omega if the u's are autocorrelated. Okay, so we have our variances on the diagonal, they could still differ. Okay, so we could have heteroscedasticity as well. But now instead of having zeros on the off diagonal elements, we now have potentially non-zero values here on the off diagonal. Okay, and it's symmetric, so we have exactly the same values up here. So what is what is this guy? This guy here. That is the covariance, sorry, the covariance of u1 and u2. Okay, and then the next guy here, that is the covariance of u1 and u3. So now we basically need an estimate of this omega, but that means we now need an estimate of an awful many values. Okay, all the diagonal elements, we in principle know how to do that, and all these off diagonal elements. Let's consider what a straight replication of the white strategy would deliver. So we would again proxy the diagonal terms, let me just highlight them with green, okay, we will proxy the diagonal terms again with our squared estimated residuals, because the argument that was valid before, that they deliver information on the variance of the first error term, the variance of the second error term, and so forth, that is still valid. But now what about our covariance between u1 and u2? The argument is now that the terms that give us information on this guy is just you, the first residual multiplied with the second residual. Okay, that is sort of a covariance term for that particular uh, covariance. And then the same, if we want to know the covariance between u1 and u3, we need to know this term here. Okay the cross product between u1 and u3 that is that's got what's gonna that's the only information we have that's gonna deliver information on that unknown term on that sigma 1 3 and so forth so you can see the indices here match each other and you could do that for the entire you could do that for the entire term now if you if you do this we should note that this is actually exactly the same, so omega hat here is exactly the same as u hat times u hat prime. Now, how does that come? Let's firstly define what do we mean with u hat. That is the vector of all estimated residuals. Okay, all the way down to, we have capital T observations, u hat capital T. This would be our u hat, and if you now calculate, if you sit down and calculate u hat times u hat prime, what you get is exactly this omega hat. Now that means, remember what we need to calculate here is this variance covariance term. Okay, that means let's just look at this center bit here x prime omega x. Now, what would happen? if we now used our particular omega hat in here. 
So we uh, just copy this from over here. So what we would get is this term. That's the center center term. The center term. Center term from our equation for variance of beta hat. Okay, x prime, and now instead of omega, we use the omega hat. So since omega hat is just u hat times u hat prime, we substitute for the omega hat u hat times u hat prime, and then I just put parenthesis around here x prime u hat and u hat times x prime. Now, of course, and here is now the insight, the key insight. What does this guy do? It basically calculates whether the x and u hats are related. Okay, that's what these two guys, and this is basically the same, just prime. So basically, we're cal the, each of these terms in parenthesis calculates this. But we know the answer to this. The answer to this is no. And that means that this guy is zero. That was again one of the properties of OLS residuals. What does that mean? That means if we used if we used omega hat as in equation one four three what would we get for the variance of beta hat? Well, the center term is going to be zero. That means the entire variance would be zero. So in one word, this is useless. Okay, because the variance of zero for beta hat doesn't make sense. So that means our straight extension of the white trick doesn't work. And here comes the new west trick. Um, I need a new um, file. So here's the trick. I just have to rearrange a little bit. Um, let me copy this across. Here is our new estimator for omega. Omega hat and a little subscript nw for new best. If you look at this, firstly the diagonal is exactly the same, the squared residuals. That's exactly the same as our sort of naive estimator omega hat we used here. And then the, the next most obvious thing that has happened is that we have set some values here to zero. Okay. So basically, we're only having values on the diagonal, then on the next subdiagonal, and here on the next subdiagonal. So here we have basically two, two subdiagonals, and then the diagonal, let me do that in red. Okay, and then up here it's exactly the same because it's symmetric. So these values here will be the same as these values. Okay, so this is this is the structure. It doesn't always have to be two subdiagonals. It could be three or four. I'll I'll say just a quick word to that later. Now I don't really want you to know any particular detail here. That's not that's not important. All I want you to realize it is that by basically re setting a lot of zeros we have achieved two things. There's a, there are fewer terms we need to estimate, okay, only those on the subdiagonals, and we have broken up this little relationship. This was based on the properties of the OLS residuals, and that just destroyed our idea because it uh, achieved that the variance of beta hat would have been zero had we used that omega hat, and that was not, uh, not really nice. And then there is one extra element in this guy. Okay, you can see new terms here. W1 
on the first subdiagonal, either above or below, and then uh, W2 on the second subdiagonal. These are sort of weighting terms. Otherwise, these terms are exactly the same as the ones we had uh, we had before. Okay, so this u1 hat times u u hat two and u1 hat times u3 hat. All these terms they appear, appeared before as well. Okay, in our naive in our naive model. Now we have these weighting guys. Now it turns out you could actually put in front of this one a weighting of one. Okay. So basically what New West now does is they decided to, to introduce this weighting scheme. Now this weighting scheme is possibly best illustrated in, in a little sort of uh, a little graph. And we have that here. Here I'll just put it right next to it. Okay. So on the diagonal we have very dark values. That means here we have weights of 1. In here, okay, there are weights of one. Then the, the light gray ones, these are the W ones, okay, W1, W1 here as well, and everywhere here we have W1 on the first subdiagonal, and then on the second subdiagonal we have W2s, okay, W2 here, W2 here, okay, this is two. Too small for you to recognize, but perhaps you can recognize the colors here. Okay, and the colors are here as well. So basically, we superimpose, and you could imagine, of course, and all the others here are zeros. Okay, these are all zeros, and that means we have zeros here. So basically, New Invest proposed to superimpose this sort of weighting scheme onto our naive estimator. And it turns out that this is the trick we need. Okay? This is exactly the trick uh, we need. And it turns out that if we calculate omega hat like this, we can perform nice inference. So let me just get the, uh, the next term here. So uh, Firstly, we have this over here. I've already described what these uh, what these cells indi indicate. They are related to these uh, to these weight indicators, and the, the weight scheme is such that we have the closer we are to the diagonal, the larger the values. So, W1 would be larger than W2, W1. But however, be smaller than one, and W two would be larger than zero. So these values are between one on the diagonal and zeros somewhere else, far enough away. So I mean, also I said that not necessarily will we have two off diagonals here. Okay, in the illustration we had two. This value here is called G. Um, in general, we calculate g as such. Okay, it's a function of the sample size. So the more observations we have, the fewer zeros we will use here. Okay, and if you use, fortunately, you don't have to do this calculation yourself. Again, eViews can calculate new revised standard errors. And how does eViews decide how many of these off diagonals we need? Is basically with this formula. Okay, so this is how. Eviews decides how to use this. Now the important, the important um, thing to note here is the following: if we have, if we have autocorrelated error terms, and we possibly know that because we found that the residuals are autocorrelated, the estimated error terms, then calculating the variance of beta hat with this scheme. Okay, so you realize it's our general variance formula. It's just this omega hat new rest that just comes from up here. Okay, then we can use this can use this for inference. 
Okay, so if you wanted, for instance, if you wanted to test a null hypothesis that the j element is equal to negative 3.4, if that hypothesis made sense, and I'd say the alternative, so I'm just making that value up, that beta j is unequal to negative 3.4, then you can use a t-test where you take your estimated value you subtract your hypothesized value and you divide by the standard error of beta j hat but that now needs to be the new rest standard error so that means it's the this guy here is a matrix okay if if that is k by 1 this guy here is going to be k by k so the square root, the j diagonal element will give us the variance of beta hat j and the square root of that will give us the standard error. And this, it turns out, is conveniently standard, normally distributed, again asymptotically. Okay, so this allows us inference.